Hi, uh, this semester I'm not teaching the lab side of class, I'm just teaching the lecture. But one thing that I was asked by some of the students in my class is if I could give an extra perspective on how, how to write your formal report. That way you've seen it from more than just one person's perspective and I can add a little bit of information about what we're looking for as faculty when you write this report. So this will give you a little bit more context for how we're going to be grading it, what we're looking for, what good quality scientific writing involves, that sort of a thing. Now, one thing I want to say straight off the bat, I am not holding the red pen. So, if the person who is holding the red pen, the person who's actually teaching your lab, has said something different than what I'm saying, follow what they say. Because sometimes they're trying to have you work on something where they're really trying to focus on, on some nuance that they've seen as a gap. So, make sure you follow with what they say. But most of us are looking for about the same things. So this should give you a pretty good context for the what and the why of the writing. And if you understand the writing's reasoning behind it, you know, it's going to have a lot more logical sense to you as you go to sit down and write the thing. Now, starting out from the very beginning, uh, in fact, let me scroll back up. Um, this isn't the first take that I'm doing, so I was already scrolled down. The first thing that we're going to have is a descriptive title. And this descriptive title is going to be a little different. In fact, the, all the writing in this report is going to be a little different than what you've been trained to do as far as your writing goes in most of the other courses. Especially with any of your fiction writing and a lot of your English classes, you've been taught to try to be really interesting in your writing, be clever in your, of your turn of phrase, that sort of a thing. In chemistry, we're actually looking for the exact opposite. We are looking for something that is as sharp and concise as a scalpel. We want you to go straight to the heart of the matter and tell us in as few words as possible all of the important information. And so, I mean, I've done research where it took us four or five years to get to the end of the experiments. And even then, it's only seven pages long. <laughs> so we are really, really stingy with our words when it comes to how we write in the sciences. And that can be really off-putting for people. But if you remember to be efficient in your words and be precise in your language, Edit the heck out of it to be exactly what you mean to say. With no extra words, no extra shrubbery, you're going to be on the right track. Now that's what we're starting to get at here in the descriptive title. We want to have four to six key words for this. And when we say key words, we're not saying the whole thing has to be four to six words long. What we're saying is that we want it to be just a very few key words and we don't want it to be a flowery kind of title. Uh, it should be a descriptive statement and definitely not a question. When it's phrased like a question, it feels like it's a third grade science fair project. We want you writing it more like a journal article in the sciences, and we don't phrase it with questions generally. Now, we have a pre-written example that I have over here in a second window. And you can see I've set it up so we can still see some of the information over here to the side while we look at it. And this is written by Mr. Campbell as an example uh, for us to use in the labs. So this is probably not an experiment you're going to be writing a report on, which makes it even better to look at since, you know, you're not doing this experiment. So the only thing you know about it is what's right here on the screen right now. And that's going to be what your reader, your grader, is going to be thinking as well. Now, I do find the very beginning of this title to be a little more cutesy than my taste prefers. I wouldn't knock points on it, but it's just not my style. I really want it to get straight to the point. It's very dry writing, like I said. So I wouldn't have like mass to atoms. What I'd have is a method for determining the thickness of zinc plating on galvanized steel. With that title, you know exactly what they're going to talk about. It's a method for finding out how thick the zinc on the outside of galvanized steel is. That's good. You want to be very specific and concise about that. Now, you want to have something about your method and something about your goal. And you can see that both of those things are right there in that title. So that's a good approach. Now, the next one is also something I don't have to say a lot about, but I'll give it a few words. The author information. It should have your name. Definitely should have your name. Let us know who the heck we're grading. Don't make us figure out which of the three people listed, if you had two lab partners, which one is it that I'm grading? We're short on time getting through these. We, if you make it easy for us to tell whose work I'm looking at, that's a good thing. It's also more like professional writing that way too. Now, you need your name, your partner's names, and the date of the experiment. Uh, that's an important thing in sciences as well because it establishes the order with which people can take credit for something. Uh, it can also explain why you might not have known about something 
if something was released just after your paper got published, two years later, people are looking at your journal article like, well, why didn't they bring this up? Because it got discovered three weeks after yours was published. This helps establish that. Now, taking a look back over here at the author information, like I said, very straightforward. Person's name, lab partner, date of the experiment. And yes, of course, we picked some silly names. What would you expect from us, right? Okay, now let's get into the abstract. And I'm gonna scroll down and have it in place, but let's come over and take a look at the rubric first. And I'm gonna scroll that down. So here, for our abstract, there's two categories that we're looking for. One is about the completeness, and one is about the quality. We're grading on quality. For completeness, we're giving you an idea of what the format should be like. And down under quality, we're talking about what sort of things should you be bringing up. Now. The general way we describe an abstract is it shouldn't be longer than maybe a half size single space page. That makes it full page if you're doing double spacing. Um, that's long enough for you to really say what you did, about 300 words, but not so much that you're starting to give much detail. This is like the dust jacket on a book. You know, you stop by and pick up the latest Game of Thrones book, which is what, like 12 years old now since he won't finish writing them, right? And you take a look at that dust jacket. You, know, you see the nice pretty artwork on the front. Then you flip it over and you look at the dust jacket and you say, is this something I want to read? Is this something that connects with my interests in life? That's what the abstract is for us in science. We're going to read that abstract and say, am I going to read this paper or not? Now, of course, the person grading it has to. But that's what we're trying to have you practice writing. So you need to be concise, 300 words. And you want to stay big picture in all of your writing here. So brief background on the system and the reaction and the experiment, we're talking two to four sentences. Let us know ultra briefly what it is you're looking at and the tiny bit of history needed to just give it a little bit of context. Very tiny bit. Right after that, you're going to say in about a sentence, what was the specific goal of this experiment? Then you'll say in a sentence or two, what method did you use to find it? In other words, notice you're not going to say a short version of your experimental process here. No, that's not what we're after at all. We're after like this much space on a page telling us how you did it. So you've got to be very concise and to the point. Jargon is your friend here. Correctly used jargon is even more of your friend, right? Then at the last part, you're going to bring up your results, possible points of error. Now, I want you to be very careful about that word error. You should never approach the word error as how did you screw up? Mm -mm -mm. If you ever say, well, we screwed this up, the grader's answer should be, well, then go do it again. Why are you communicating results that you know are wrong? That's going to be what we would say scientifically. So you never think of error as being how you screwed up. Error is about how tightly your work is going to match the perfect answer measurement. And sometimes, you can be somewhat crude in a measurement. Um, you know, it, suppose that you were using drones to measure the area, you know, affected by red uh, algae, by red tide algae. You know, you could bring up the fact that, you know, because of the season, I don't know, I'm making this part up. I'm trying to specifically go outside of chemistry for this example for a second because we have chemistry on the other screen. You might say something like, because this particular phenomenon is only active at this time of day, which is also the same time as reflection comes off the water. There is some uh, difficulty in measuring these margins. That means we're within plus or minus 5% for the final answer. However, those results will be totally sufficient for determining this other blah, 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 blah. That's the kind of thing we're talking about when we say error. We're not saying, how did you screw up? We're saying, we know you did your best to have a well-controlled experiment. How far do those controls take you? Like, where's the borderland for when you're gonna need a more advanced or refined study? That's really what we're saying when we use the word error. So be very careful with that because that really messes with us if you try to treat it as, how did you screw up? The last part of the uh, abstract is typically a summary sentence saying what you learned. Now, don't focus on the word learned in an educational sense. We're not asking, by doing this experiment, I learned how to do a titration and how important it is to use the right indicator to... By doing this experiment, we determined the amount of chloride ion in salt water samples. 
That's what you learned scientifically. That's what we're after. Not what you learned educationally. What did you determine as the end result of this experiment? Sometimes it's a number. Sometimes it's an outcome. But you're going to give a single sentence summary of what you found. The biggest highlight. Because remember, this is the dust jacket on the novel. Now let's take a look at an example. In this one they say that, you know, Galvin, and I'm going to skim this because I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. That would be really tedious. So galvanized steel is a material containing of a steel coated, a steel center coated with a thin layer of zinc. Notice that it's saying blah, blah, blah. This is why we did it. It's there to protect the inside metal. This section right here is the whole part we said about brief background information. The reader may not realize galvanized steel is a layer of zinc on the outside of steel. That's all that we're doing. We're letting them know what is it that we're studying. Now, next up, we say what the purpose is. The purpose was determined was to determine the average thickness of that zinc coating. That is our brief experiment goal. Now, next up, we needed to say what is our method? Hydrochloric acid will rapidly reduce it. We can do mass and length measurements to find the physical properties. We use the acid to remove the coating. We measured it again. This is very, very briefly what our experimental method was. What was our result? We found the average thickness to be this with a standard deviation of this. What kind of error do we have? This one is getting a little bit not ideally written for my taste because we were trying to write this as like a student writing this, giving some examples, and this one actually gets used as an exercise where we go through and compare like six different versions of this report to see what's good and what's bad. Now in this one, like I said, this isn't quite as tight as I would personally like it. It sounds a little bit more like we could have some screw-ups, but really what we're saying here is, okay, we had some limited sensitivity for the mass and the measuring devices. Okay, that's reasonable. Another source of error arises from dissolving the zinc in the hydrochloric acid solution. Metal is dried using paper towel, but some water may have clung to the surface area, increasing weight after the reaction. Now, do notice that when we bring up error here, as a reader, you might be able to say, well, you know, what they could have done is just toss that metal into the oven to get that water off. That's fine. That's exactly the kind of thing we're talking about. And that's the purpose of writing this in there at all. It's so that the reader can say, oh, you know, I get what they did. That's going to be a solid way to do it. But there's this tweak that I'd do if I were doing it, and it would improve the results like blah. That's what you're after for this whole section on possible points of error. Finally, you say what the outcome was. In this case, you're saying it looks like a good method for finding the thickness of galvanized steel. And notice that it's a pretty good bragging right. We're talking about measuring in the end, something that's 1 times 10 to the negative fourth centimeters thick. So we're talking really thin, right? That's what we're determining in this experiment. That's something to brag about. That's kind of the thing that we're doing in the abstract. It's the highlights reel. It's the dust jacket. Okay, I'm beating that one to death pretty well. Let's take a look at the quality section here as well. It should act to summarize the whole paper, only have the most important points. Check, that example had that. Should have enough background to introduce a concept. We did that, but it's a very brief introduction, right? Answers the question, why should we be interested a bit? I mean, coming back over, yeah, I mean, it, it gives an idea of why we would be interested is, hey, we can measure the thickness, all right? That works. You know, the thickness matters because it's protecting the inside of the steel. All right. The description of the experimental procedure should be limited to main points. Check. The results should include critical information. Um, I'm going to scroll some more. Um, mean, standard deviation, that kind of stuff. Factors of error, things that could affect it adversely. Never, ever, ever, ever use the idea or words human error. No. Like I said earlier, when you say human error, you say we screwed up. When you say we screwed up in a lab report or a journal article, the reader immediately says, you're telling me you screwed up. Why should I believe any of this? This is garbage then. And you've lost all credibility. The purpose is to say, how can this be, how tight was this measurement done? And how could we tighten it up even further if we had to for your next stage research? That's what you're after. Not human error. <laughs> Don't say human error ever. 
So that's what we're after for all of these sort of things. And you can see here, just to come back to the rubric, um, you know, if you start losing some of the items over on this little blurb, same thing down here, if you're losing some of those pieces or you're not writing very clearly or not writing very briefly, that's when you start losing points. Bringing up the words human error is enough to lose half the points right there in that category, just about, so don't say human error. Okay, beating that to death, I know. So let me scroll on from there. Next up, we get to our experimental procedures. And this is where I wanna make sure that we have some real understanding of what you're doing. Now, this is broken down into three pieces for our rubric. One of the procedures and techniques, one on the instrumentation, equipments, and chemicals, and one on the, ex on the formatting and the grammar. Now, I'm going to give you some information here and some philosophy here, I guess, that may not be exactly what the person who's grading it is looking for. It probably will be, but there may be some minor differences here. So do be aware of that. This is one of those spots where you want to make sure that you've got a reality check of what your instructor has said they're looking for. Now, let's run through what we're looking at for each of these three categories briefly, and then we'll look at the paper again. The procedures and techniques. Describing your own words in enough detail for someone else to replicate the experiment. Keep in mind they might be using different equipment. So don't give all the details about, first, turn on the spectrometer with the red button. No, they've got a different instrument probably. You don't need to get that picky. Presume that they know how to work their own gear. I know, it's a big presumption, right? But assume that they know how to work their own gear. That's kind of what you can think of here. Um, and one thing that I don't love about the way this is worded right now and we're still editing these to get them even more refined each continuing semester. This one really sounds like what you're doing is you're translating the procedure into the experimental section. And so what your instinct is to do is you're gonna copy with your mouse the section of the lab manual. You're gonna go to your Word document and you're gonna hit paste. And you're gonna say, okay, here's written to step one, step two, step three. I'm supposed to be writing it as a paragraph. I want that right down in here. In paragraph format, don't use a bulleted or numbered list. Use passive voice. So what people usually do is they'll just copy paste it. They'll go through and remove any bullet points or step one, step two, step three things. And they'll convert it from the imperative voice. Measure this volume in a beaker. And we'll turn it into the passive voice. This volume was measured in a beaker. Mm, that's, that's missing the point. That's not what the goal of this section is. The section isn't to tell someone how to do the experiment. That's why I don't love the wording that we have right in here. You need enough detail that someone could create an experiment of their own to replicate your result. But the point isn't to tell them how it was done so much. Here's the hidden part that's, that's right behind the surface. This is the most important part of this whole video probably. The point of the experimental section is not to tell someone how to do the experiment, believe it or not. It's there to communicate to the reader, oh man, this guy knows his stuff. Man, he nailed it. Look at all these controls. I don't need to replicate that work. Not only has it already been done before, but they nailed it. They thought through all the stuff that needs to be done. Man, they got some tight controls there. Their values are gonna be spot on. I trust this work. That's the purpose of the experimental section. The point of the experimental section is to convince the reader that you have done a well-constructed, well-controlled experiment that answers the question at hand. Snap capital letters at the beginning of each one of those words. That's how, that's how emphatic I am about that piece. If you're thinking like that, you're gonna write a good experimental section. Don't copy paste the lab manual and translate it to past tense, passive voice. Terrible. Write it from scratch, and at every sentence, ask yourself, what was just done and why? How did that make this controlled? Sometimes it's as tiny as, an analytical balance was used to measure the masses to four decimal places. Hmm, it starts to sound a little bit like a control, huh? Because you're going to four decimal places. You're communicating the quality of the measurement being done. Next, the mass was transferred into a flask with care taken that none was lost. Okay, works for me. 
What you're doing is you're showing all the, all the major things you did and why they led to the controlled experiment. Now, instruments and experimental and chemicals, don't just do a list. Bring them up as you're using them. So, like a 5.6 milligram sample was measured using a serological pipette. This tells the amount that got used, the sig figs are communicating the quality of the measurement, the equipment being used, serological pipette, communicates the quality of the work being done. All of that shows that you're doing a well-constructed, well-controlled experiment with answers to that question at hand. So let's come back over to the method over here on this paper. A small piece of steel was obtained, wiped off with a paper towel. Ooh, that's a missed opportunity. You could be pointing out that it was cleaned with a paper towel to ensure no oil protected the surface. See? You're showing why you did a great job and it's really controlled and nails the answer. It was masked, measured, whatever, uh, using an analytical balance. Tells the quality of the measurement. Notice, we're not saying what kind of a beaker it is. We said it's 150, but that's it. Why? Because you've seen the lines on a beaker. They don't tell you anything about the volume, really. It's 50 milliliter markings with a plus minus 5% error bar. They're basically just juice cups for chemicals. That's all that they are. They're not high quality. We're just saying it was put into a container and moving on. Now, we got more picky about that serological pipette thing a minute ago, remember? That's because that, that, con that communicated a quality. And we showed, okay, so we put it in there, we saw it was bubbling like crazy, we flipped it a few times to make sure it came in contact with both surfaces of the sheet. Well, there's a typo there, no surfaces, should be plural. Notice there that they brought up the flipping it, not as a direction, but as a control. We flipped it to make sure both sides reacted thoroughly. Once it stopped fizzing, we diluted it, transferred it, measured it, masked it again, repeated it three times. Man, that's short and sweet. It won't always be short. It won't always be sweet. Aim for short and sweet. But the key thing is, make sure you convince the reader you've got a well-controlled, well-designed experiment that answers the question at hand. You'll be getting all three of these categories for full points on that. Now, one thing I'll also mention over here on this experimental formatting and grammar. We emphasize that it should be past tense and passive voice. Well, it should be past tense. You already did the experiment. If you're writing future tense, you're a time traveler and I don't want to read it. I'm going to ruin the future if I do that, right? We know it's past tense, so write it in past tense. Now, the passive voice thing, we beat that to death as a rule in undergraduate classrooms. I'm going to tell you not breaking a vow of silence or anything, but I'll tell you that realistically, we are not totally married to it being passive tense. It's okay to say that you did something. That, that happens in real journal articles. But here's why we don't give that honest assessment to you, because it's easy to start doing that in your writing and miss the point. The reason that we tell you to write the passive voice, well, think about what it sounds like when you write passive voice. First, this was done. That sets up the question of why was it done? We're trying to get you into the explaining mode instead of the giving directions mode. If I just give directions, it reads like the lab manual. When you are explaining it, you're starting to use the past tense more, just kind of naturally. By telling you to focus on past tense, it helps flip a switch in your mind that helps you focus on explaining a little bit better. That's why people always beat to death the idea that it's got to be passive voice. It usually is. It doesn't have to be in professional writing. At this stage, we're pretending like it does for you because it tricks you into writing it the right way, basically. So be aware of that. Uh, this is definitely one of those spots where I may vary a little bit from other faculty. If I got something that had some active voice sentences, as long as it's well written, I'm not gonna be digging you on the isolated phrase that's active voice because the purpose was to get you to explain. If you explained it well, that's good enough for me. Some people might be more nitpicky about that and just see it as a matter of professional pride and um, clarity and precision. That's legit. People have different styles. So, you know, know what style you're writing for and who's got the grade book. All right, coming down from there, we're heading into the results section. Now, the most important part of the results section, honestly, is having correct results. So make sure that your calculations are done right. Notice that here, measured data, calculated results, and tables. You need to show them in table and graph form. Make sure it's logical and orderly. Make sure everything's well labeled. Remember those units and sig figs? Use those units and sig figs. Be care. 
Does it fit on one page? I hope so, because if not, I'm not knowing what those cells are without scrolling back and forth and getting seasick going back and forth. So if you actually do have such a giant table that the data needs to span two pages, number one, ask yourself why. Is it really important that the reader sees every single one of those numbers? Now at the undergraduate level, that's really unlikely. But for some of the stuff I do, if I'm doing a spectrum from 400 to 700 nanometers, do I actually need to show them all of the data for each individual nanometers and its absorbance? No, what are they gonna do with it? I need to show them the part that matters. I need to digest it down to the most important details for them. That's part of what you're doing right here with this piece. So make sure it's well ordered. If it's orderly, it makes sense. You put it in there in an orderly data table with correct sig figs and units, and everything is good to go there. If you're starting to miss those things or making it messy, that's when you start to lose points. Okay, so if we got our units and our values and everything's looking good there, we're setting ourselves up for success. You need to have a section about error analysis. Remember, error does not mean you screwed up. It's a question of how tight your results are going to be to the perfect value using the magic wand of knowing stuff. Guess what? Magic wand of knowing stuff doesn't exist. So you're trying to convince the reader that you're doing the best job you can without having that magic wand. So you're gonna show some numbers that'll help. Maybe you have an average and a standard deviation. You're gonna have a percent error versus the expected value, an R squared if it's something that actually can be shown as a linear regression model where you expect it to be a straight line. Then great, show me an R squared. Combination of those things, that's the stuff you wanna have in there. Show appropriate stats. Um, standard deviation, just to remind you, standard deviation is about the grouping. How tight is your grouping around the average value? Big grouping, tight grouping. That's what the standard deviation is telling you. That's not telling you how accurate it was. For that, you still need the magic wand of knowing stuff or a better measurement that was done in advance. So if somebody tells you, according to the really awesome lab at the MIST, government labs, here's the real value. My ma measurement is over here. This is the real value. The distance between those is the accuracy. How well do you match up to the known value? Precision is how tight the grouping is. Make sure you're getting that right because that's a spot we often see people make mistakes. Um, theoretical values can often be used for that sort of a thing too. Um, make sure you describe it with your statistics um, and make sure that you're describing them well. One thing I'll point out for you, uh, and you probably don't want to include this in your write-up, but just to help you with your understanding, if you have a linear model and you have an R-squared value for that, that is actually, uh, philosophically speaking, the percentage difference from a perfect straight line, which means a perfect relationship between the y-axis variable and the x-axis variable. If it's not a perfect relationship, or more likely, if it is a perfect relationship, but the measurements aren't perfect, there's gonna be a bit of scatter around that, right? So R squared ends up giving you an idea of how controlled your variables are. Because if you have uncontrollable variables, you know, stuff that varies no matter what you do, that's gonna to contribute to the R squared. So if I have an R squared of 0.995, that means 99.5% of the uh, behavior is attributable to a straight line model. The remaining 0.5% was randomness and uncontrolled variables. Did the temperature change during the course of the experiment? That kind of stuff. So that's what we're talking about for R squared, just to give you a feel for what it actually means in the back end. If you described it that way, people may not love that because they're not expecting you to be bringing that up in a Chem 1 class. And that's also getting pretty deep into the weeds for an analytical chemist. Not everybody's an analytical chemist, and so they may not be thinking of R squared in that way. I wouldn't communicate it that way, but if it's in the back of your mind, it can be helpful. All right, anyway, what else do you need to have in your results section? So you have your blurb here, you have your stats. Now we also need to show sample calculations. Why do we show sample calcs? We need to show one of each important type of calculation to prove to the reader that, you know, everything was done makes sense. Now that doesn't show up in a journal article usually, that's gonna be maybe in an appendix to the article or something like that, or supplemental information. Um, but it's important for us, especially in a classroom setting, because we still have to figure out what the heck were you doing when you did this? I don't think that number makes sense to me. How did you get there? Oh, you forgot to control, uh, you forgot to account for it being milliliters instead of liters. You know, stuff like that. We need it there to make sure we can follow what the heck you're doing. So make sure you've got your sample calculations. Show one of each one, 
show it longhand. You don't have to type it. At least I don't think you have to type it. That adds a whole lot of time to the process. If you handwrite it in legible fashion, scan it or take a picture, use cam scanner or something like that, and you put that into your report, good for me. I don't think anybody else is insisting that you learn um, how to actually do the markup languages to make math equations look nice in Word. I don't think we care about that. If somebody really does, then that's something that they're having to learn. But, you know, again, go with what the grader says, not with what I say, but that's usually the intent. All right, now let's just take a quick look at what the calculation section or results section looks like here. Look, nice labeled values. Notice that they only put the unit over here on the side instead of in each and every cell. That's smart. You might think, well, no, you should really put it in each one. Why? It's already labeled. Good enough for me. I know what you've got there. On top of that, I'm expecting that if you were really clever about it, you might have done this in Excel and had Excel be your calculator instead of you grabbing a calculator to calculate each one of these things underneath it. So you can link all these things together and have the data work up automatically. I'm expecting that you did. And that's another reason you have to have your unit somewhere else. Um, make sure it's well organized. This is pretty well organized. If you want to get fancy and make the header here bold and over here bold so that it's easy to tell those are labels, oh, sorry, it doesn't highlight the same way, go for it if you feel like it, but this is small enough that you don't need it. Then look at this. Well laid out. Makes sense. Consistent sig figs. Looks good to me. If you don't want to, if you don't know how to do this, you could even do three different cells. You could have the average value in one cell, type plus minus in a middle cell, have your standard deviation in the next one. That would be totally fine too. Hey look, sample calculations. They showed the equation. They showed us using the equation. They showed the answer. The reason we do that in the real world is it makes everything auditable. We can make sure that the results are correct. I actually was hired to do a review of all the procedures for a Fortune 500 company a couple years back. And some of their calculations in their book were wrong. By having sample calcs, I could find out that there was a problem with that and fix it for them. So we need to have it in the documentation. That's basically what we're replicating here and teaching you how to do. So you show the major calculations. You only have to show one of each one. We don't care about seeing you do three different calcs of the average of the total volume. We just need to see one. Get down here, here's the standard deviation. You showed us the standard deviation longhand. Great. What I usually do in my classes is if they've already shown me one of these longhand, I don't make you replicate that every single time. But that's depending on who you have for lab. Uh, for me, it's more like I'm teaching you how to be a process control engineer where you actually have a single notebook with all this stuff in it. So if you've done, demonstrated it on a previous page, it's fine on the next page, that kind of a thing. Other people want you to do it each time. Now here's where the biggest difference between how I have you write reports comes in versus the way others will. And for this, we're coming down here to the discussion. Now here it says in paragraph format, discuss, discuss the broader implications of the experiment. In other words, it's saying, describe what it means. Refer back to the previous data. Show me what it means. Extend it out to be, well, what does it actually tell me? Um, you're getting to the deeper idea of it. Now, that said, that's a harder thing for us to write at the Chem 1 level sometimes. So what often people will have you do instead is take the discussion questions from the lab manual and answer the discussion question in paragraph form. So the distinction I'm making is, for my classes, I like to have them write a discussion and in the process of discussing the data, make sure you answer each of the discussion questions accidentally while you're writing it. So just naturally bring up those topics. That's kind of how I want my people to do it in that one long report that we do. Just so they can get a feel for it, because that feels more like a real authentic lab report. That said. That's a nightmare to grade for us. It takes way longer to read that and write it and write responses to it and things. So a lot of the faculty are gonna have you stay on the discussion question format like you see here on the page. Because like I said, it's easier to grade and it's easier for you to write because it doesn't involve you integrating things quite as much. There's legitimate reasons both ways. But make sure you know who the person that's grading you, how they're gonna grade it. You know, so be aware of that and just make sure you read through the rubric and it'll remind you of all the little details. But short version is, have it be about four sentences long, maybe longer if you need it. Be complete enough that we can follow what you're talking about. Uh, it should be an in-depth answer. Um, 
you can answer additional questions to make it make sense, but don't answer a question with a question. Um, dig a little bit deeper, but we're not expecting you to have a PhD on the topic. Write it like you're writing to another Gen Chem 1 student, which is usually what we tell you to do. If you needed a calculation to show it, show a sample calculation for that. Your discussion completeness is also in that section. Did you answer it in paragraph format? You know, that kind of a thing. And then finally, we have an overall formatting and grammar. Make sure that you are smart when you write it, not I are smart and you get it all wrong. You know, write it in a refined, polished way. Uh, we're looking for a report. It's a paper. Treat it like a paper. Use good grammar. Uh, sometimes I get them in and I'm just like, no, no, this doesn't make sense. These, these are just words. This is word salad. Now, the last thing is not on the rubric, but I want to make sure I recommend everybody. Once you've written it, Close your eyes and rewrite it in your brain. Just take take like a minute and a half and rewrite it in your brain. Open your eyes up again and look at it and say, did everything I just say in my head come across on the page? It probably didn't. That's when you edit. So look for the spots that don't match up to how you were thinking once you read the words actually on the page. Remember, the words you were having here may not have ended up on the page. So this is where you're checking to make sure that it did. Always give it an edit. Don't feel like you're such an amazing writer that you're done in one draft. I'm still working on a paper that I'm gonna submit and I'll work on it right up until the day I do submit it. And then I'll start on the next one. That's how we have to work in science. Make sure you're writing to high quality for this stuff. Now you can see here that they've got the rest of it. They've got some references. I don't personally see the need to cite the lab manual I consider it to be an assumed uh, item. Some people really want you to get in the habit of citing everything like that. So if your lab instructor wants you to cite it, cite it. If they specifically have told you not to, don't worry about it. If they didn't really say anything about citing it one way or the other, you can't go wrong with citing the thing, so go ahead and do it. Okay, sorry, I know that this ended up being 37 minutes of me giving advice. Um, worst case scenario, I hope that you just played me at faster speed uh, and best, my uh, biggest uh, takeaway of all is I hope you got something out of this and you see that there's some philosophy and some intentionality behind what we're asking you to write. And if you understand what's on the other side of it, you're going to have a better paper. If you have a better paper, you're going to get a better grade. At least that's the hope, right? All right, with that, if you have any questions, you can always come talk to me as well. I don't mind answering questions. I can't promise you I've got time to give like a full review of a lab report right now because as we're sitting here close to finals week, and if I ever reuse this video, these reports are always due right around finals week, right? Um, it gets a little bit tight to give everybody detailed review, but I can definitely sit down with you and have a discussion about what you're doing and why and give you some feedback on isolated pieces. Okay, with that, I hope you found this helpful.